Prophecy in the Times of the Gentiles in Daniel Daniel's Second Vision Persia and Greece Daniel 8, 1-4 through The second vision of Daniel in the third year of Belshazzar, which can be dated approximately 550 BC, also preceded the final destruction of Babylon in 539 BC. The prophecy in this vision, however, has to do with the second and third kingdoms implied in the image of Daniel 2 as the upper part of the body and the arms of silver and the lower parts of the body and thighs of brass. Little detail is given in either Daniel 2 or Daniel 7 about the second and third kingdoms, though their presence is recognized. Daniel here recorded a vision that gave in detail how the second and third kingdoms would come on the scene. Daniel described his vision as occurring while he was in Susa, biblical Shushan, in the province of Elam, a Persian capital about 200 miles from Babylon. Daniel was not involved in the kingdom reign of Belshazzar, and why he was in Susa was not explained. Later, after the Medo-Persians had conquered Babylon, Xerxes built a great palace in the city, which was the scene of the Book of Esther and where Nehemiah served as King Artaxerxes' cupbearer, Nehemiah 111. In his vision, Daniel saw himself alongside the Ulai Canal. The Ulai River flowed from 150 miles north of Shushan to the Tigris River to the south. The location of the vision is important only for implying the background of the vision dealing with Medo-Persia and Greece. As Daniel described the vision, he wrote, quote, There before me was a ram with two horns, standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as he charged toward the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him, and none could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. End quote. Daniel 8, 3 and 4. Later in the vision, Daniel identified the ram, quote, The two-horned ram which you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia, verse 20. The ram clearly corresponded to the empire of the Medes and the Persians because having two horns represented Media and Persia, and the longer horn represented the greater power of Persia. They were able to destroy everything that was before them going to the west, north, and south, verse 4. This included the conquest of Babylon as well as other countries to the west of Persia. The Persian power historically reached its biblically significant triumph when Babylon was conquered in October 539 BC. Until Alexander the Great came on the scene 200 years later, Persian power was predominant. Though Daniel was alive and observed the fulfillment of prophecies surrounding the destruction of Babylon and the coming of the Medes and the Persians in his lifetime, he did not live long enough to see the outcome of Persia rule as this prophecy revealed. Daniel 8, 5 through 8. As Daniel was watching the ram conquering all before it, he wrote, quote, Suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. He came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in great rage. I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. The goat became very great, but at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. End quote. Verse 5 through 8. Daniel later declared, quote, The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. End quote. Verse 21. As Daniel plainly stated, the goat represented Greece, a country that was small and insignificant when Daniel lived, but was destined to rule the Middle East in the time of Alexander the Great. Instead of two horns, which would be normal for a goat, only one large horn was placed between the eyes of the goat, who was declared to be, quote, the first king, end quote, verse 21. The whole vision concerning Greece was most appropriate to describe the conquest of Alexander the Great, who with rapid marches of his army conquered the whole Middle East and went as far as India. No conqueror preceding Alexander ever conquered more territory so quickly. Accordingly, the fact that the goat was pictured as not touching the ground but flying through the air would correspond to Alexander's rapid conquest. This was implied also in Daniel 7, where the third empire, Greece, was compared to a leopard, a very swift animal that in Daniel's vision was described as having four wings implying great speed. Daniel 7 verse 2 
The prediction that the large horn representing Alexander the Great would be broken off at the peak of his power was literally fulfilled in Alexander's death in Babylon as he and his armies had returned from a conquest of India to celebrate. Alexander the Great died in 323 BC at 33 years of age, a man who could conquer the world but could not conquer himself. After Alexander's death, his conquests were divided among four generals as indicated by the four horns. Cassander ruled Macedonia and Greece. Lysimachus ruled Thrace, Bithynia, and most of Asia Minor. Seleucus ruled Syria and the near east of Syria, including Babylon. Ptolemy ruled Egypt and probably Palestine and Arabia. Though another leader under Alexander, Antigonus, attempted to gain power, he was easily defeated. It was another testimony to the accuracy of Daniel's prophetic vision that the conquests of Alexander the Great were divided into four sections, not three or five. The accuracy was so clear that liberal scholars want to consider this account to have been written after the fact by one who assumed the name of Daniel, but who actually was not the 16th century BC character described in the Bible. Daniel 8, 9-12 as Daniel continued to observe the vision, he saw a little horn come up in addition to the four prominent horns, verse 8, and this little horn grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land, end quote. Verse 9, the prophecies are very accurate as to direction. The ram, the Medo-Persian Empire, went largely to the west and not to the east in keeping with what the Medo-Persian Empire did. The goat instead, coming from Greece in the west, attacked the Middle East from the west, verse 5, in keeping with the conquests of Alexander the Great that were always east of Greece. But the little horn mentioned here manifested his power to the south and to the east and toward the quote-unquote beautiful land, referring to the Holy Land. There is an obvious distinction between the little horn that is mentioned here and the little horn of Daniel 7, 8. The little horn of Daniel 7 came out of the fourth empire and in its final stage, which when properly interpreted, still refers to the future. By contrast, the little horn of Daniel 8 came out of the third kingdom, the goat, and refers to prophecy that has already been fulfilled. Daniel reported further on the vision, quote, it grew until it reached the host of the heavens and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the hosts. It took away the daily sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Because of rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifices were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground." End quote. Daniel 8, 10-12 The difficulty in understanding this portion of scripture has given rise to a number of theories of interpretation. As mentioned earlier in the introduction of Daniel, liberal scholars hold that the book of Daniel was a forgery written in the second century because they believe that prophecy of the future is impossible. This conclusion is contradicted by the finding of the Qumran scrolls in which a complete copy of Daniel was found. Even liberal scholars on the basis of their own presuppositions have difficulty in harmonizing this archaeological find with the idea that a pseudo-Daniel wrote the book of Daniel in the second century when what was presented as prophecy was already history. Conservative scholars reject this, of course, and accept the inspiration and authority of the book of Daniel as it was held for many years throughout the Old Testament period and for hundreds of years in the Christian era. A second interpretation holds that Daniel's prophecy has already been fulfilled in the person of Antiochus Epiphanes, a ruler of Syria, 175 to 164 BC. In general, conservative interpreters, whether premillennial or all-millennial, agree on this interpretation. A third view is that this prophecy was fulfilled historically in the 2nd century BC, but typically represented the future world ruler of the Great Tribulation before the Second Coming. This is supported by the reference to the quote-unquote time of the end, verse 17 and 19. The best approach is to accept this as primarily fulfilled prophecy, as Antiochus Epiphanes met the requirements set down in this prophecy, though this may typically picture the time of the end. According to history, Antiochus Epiphanes set himself up as God, thus disregarding, quote, the starry host, end quote, or the powers of heaven. He set himself up as the prince of the host, verse 11, in the sense of making himself great. Antiochus took away and stopped the daily sacrifices offered by the Jews in the temple and desecrated their sanctuary, verse 13, 
turning it into a pagan temple. He fulfilled the requirements of throwing truth to the ground, verse 12. History has recorded that by the taking the name Epiphanes, which means, quote-unquote, glorious one, Antiochus assumed that he was God, much as the little horn of Daniel 7 will do in the future Great Tribulation. His role is similar to the future role of the coming world dictator, Daniel 8, 13 and 14. Daniel reported hearing two described as holy ones, apparently angels, discussing how long it would take for this vision to be fulfilled. Defined as the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, and the surrender of the sanctuary and of the host that will be trampled underfoot. End quote. Verse 13. Daniel was told by the angel, quote, It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. End quote. Verse 14. If there were some agreement that the earlier verses refer to Antiochus Epiphanes, verse 14 adds additional revelation that has caused a number of differing points of view. Many of the details referred to in the preceding verses were recorded in the historical book of 1 Maccabees, which describes the desecration of the temple, the persecution of the Jewish people, and the so-called Maccabean revolt of the Jews. Antiochus Epiphanes killed thousands of Jews in an attempt to stamp out the Jewish religion, but it was all to no avail. However, the statement that it would take 2,300 evenings and mornings before the sanctuary could be reconsecrated has caused many different opinions because it is not entirely clear what it means. Seventh-day Adventists understand 2,300 days to refer to 2,300 years and on the basis of this expected culmination of the second coming in the year 1884. History, however, of course, has demonstrated that this was not the proper answer. Others have taken it that 2,300 days, including evening and morning sacrifices, were actually 1,150 days, that is, 2,300 evenings and mornings. This view is difficult to harmonize with the history of the period. Probably the best interpretation goes back to the fact that in the year 171 BC, Anias III, who was the reigning high priest, was assassinated and another line of priests assumed power. This was the beginning of the desecration but the temple itself was not desecrated until December 25th, 167 BC, when the sacrifices were forcibly stopped. A Greek altar was placed in the temple, and a Greek statue representing a pagan god was erected. If the period from 171 BC to 164 BC, the year Antiochus died, is considered that period, the total of 2,455 days would be reduced to 2,300 days if the parts of the first and last years were subtracted. This would account for the 2,300 days as a round number. The history of the case does not provide enough detail to determine exactly how the fulfillment was accomplished. Taking everything into consideration, it is best to consider the 2,300 days as fulfilled at the time in the 2nd century BC and not subject to prophetic fulfillment in the future. Daniel 8, 15-22 Daniel, as he was watching the vision, recorded that the one who stood beside him was, quote, like a man, end quote, but probably was an angel, verse 15. Daniel also heard a man's voice instructing Gabriel, an angel, to give Daniel the interpretation of the dream, verse 16. This was the first mention of the angel Gabriel in scripture. He is also mentioned in Daniel 9.21, Luke 1.19, verse 26. While angels were given numerous titles in apocryphal literature, the Bible names only one other angel, Michael, Daniel 10.13, Daniel 10.21, Daniel 12.1, Jude 9, Revelation 12.7. When Gabriel came to him, Daniel fell prostrate before this holy angel, Daniel 8.17. Daniel was addressed as son of man and instructed to Understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. Verse 17. The encounter with the angel caused Daniel to go into a deep sleep, but Gabriel raised him to his feet. Verse 18. Gabriel then confirmed the interpretation of the ram and the goat and the details of the vision. He stated, quote, I am going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. 
The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. End quote. Verse 19 through 21. As Gabriel's interpretation has been confirmed by history, it is comparatively easy to find a consensus of conservative interpreters relating this passage as referring to the Medo-Persia and Greece. Daniel 8, 23 through 26. This portion has been the subject of endless discussion and difference of opinion following several interpretations. One, the idea that this has already been completely fulfilled in history by Antiochus and Epiphanes. Two, that this represents a period entirely future, referring to the final world ruler. Three, that it is a prophecy concerning Antiochus Epiphanes, but that in some sense it has a double fulfillment because of the similarity between him and the end time world ruler. Daniel described the wicked king of this prophecy as, quote, a stern faced king, a master of intrigue, end quote, verse 23. He stated that, quote, he will become very strong but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed at whatever he does. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power." End quote. Verse 24 and 25. The description given here of this wicked ruler is very similar to what history and the Bible record concerning Antiochus Epiphanes. He did have great power over the Holy Land in Syria for a time and had power in Egypt until he had to withdraw because of Roman pressure. He devastated the Hebrew worship and desecrated the temple. He killed thousands of Jews who attempted to continue their worship in opposition to him. He considered himself above others. In fact, he claimed to be God, indicated by his title Epiphanes which means glorious one. He obviously opposed Christ as the Prince of Princes, verse 25. Antiochus died of natural causes in 164 BC while on a military campaign, indicating that, quote, he will be destroyed, but not by human power, end quote, verse 25. Daniel had been instructed in verse 17 that, quote, the vision concerns the time of the end, end quote. He was further instructed that the vision was true, but to seal up the vision, for it concerns the distant future. Verse 26. This passage, though fulfilled by Antiochus, is also typical of the description of the future role of the coming Antichrist, the man of sin, the dictator of the whole world during the last three and a half years before the second coming. Some believe that this also has prophetic overtones and anticipates the climax of the ages. While the controversy cannot be completely settled, it can be understood that this prophecy is certainly an illustration in history of what would take place in prophecy of the yet future Great Tribulation. Like Antiochus, the final world ruler will claim to be God, will persecute Jews, will stop Jewish sacrifices, and will be an evil character. Daniel 8.27 Daniel, who had been brought through tremendous emotional strain in the course of receiving this vision, wrote, quote, I, Daniel, was exhausted and lay ill for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. End quote. Verse 27. What was prophecy for Daniel in the 6th century BC here can be constructed as being literally fulfilled. But even though they approximate so nearly the character, the stopping of sacrifices, and other qualities of the final world ruler, many feel that this is a shadow of things yet to be fulfilled. Introduction to the Prophecy of the Seventy Sevens Daniel the prophet was not only revealing the tremendous prophecies concerning the times of the Gentiles embracing the four great empires beginning with Babylon and ending with Rome and the final destruction of Gentile power by the second coming, but he also received in his third vision in the next chapter a detailed chronology of Israel's future, culminating in the second coming of Christ. Because of the revelation given through Daniel, both concerning the times of the Gentiles and the program of God for Israel, the prophecies of Daniel are the key to understanding the major prophecies of Scripture in both the Old and New Testaments. In Daniel 9, three important segments are presented. 1. The approaching fulfillment of Israel's return to the land. 2. The remarkable prayer of Daniel in view of the approaching fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 3-19. through 19. 
3. The important prophecy concerning the 77s of Israel's future, culminating in the second coming. The events of this chapter followed the earlier two visions of Daniel in 553 BC and 550 BC and the downfall of the Babylonian Empire in Daniel 5, 539 BC. Daniel's experience in the lion's den, chapter 6, verse 1 through 24, was not clearly before or after the vision of Daniel 9, as the vision was not dated. The great prophecies given to Nebuchadnezzar as well as to Daniel and the fulfillment of the downfall of Babylon must have given Daniel a great sense of the sovereignty of God and the certainty of prophecy being literally fulfilled. It was with this background that Daniel reported his discovery of the prophecy of Jeremiah concerning the 70 years of Israel's captivity.